So in this example, it's an autonomic reflex of, you know, you were thinking this morning, like for example, I, I taught cranial nerve 3, which constricts the pupil, that smooth muscle, that's an example of an autonomic reflex. Any reflex, whether somatic or autonomic, will have a sensory cell. Okay, here's a motor cell, and the motor cell has a preganglionic and a postganglionic efferent. Um, on my next example, it's like an, a, an example of a somatic reflex. Maybe you have a sensory receptor in the skin. Maybe you feel a painful stimulus. You have a sensory neuron. You have an inner neuron. And you have a motor neuron. Okay, the inner neuron is completely contained within the central nervous system. In this case, the spinal cord. <coughs> Basically, you always have sets of cells for sensory function. You may have interneurons, okay, and you'll have motor cells, motor neurons. first uh, couple of slides, that should not be new information. You should understand that. We've talked about it before. I give an example of a reflex, a knee-jerk reaction. You take a hammer and you tap the tendon, uh, well specifically the patellar ligament, and you kick. Okay, uh, Knee-jerk. When you tap the tendon, You're stretching a muscle spindle inside the muscle, okay? And the spindles resist the stretch. So you resist the stretch by contracting. So it's the quadriceps femoris that's stretching. So understand. voluntary or involuntary? Involuntary. And you don't think to do it. A knee-jerk reaction just, just happens. So we're studying things in the spinal cord that are involuntary. And uh, basically, the tendon tap is an example of the muscle spindle, which is the sense organ that we haven't studied yet.
So in the first reflex action we'll study, let's learn the anatomy of a muscle spindle. Um, there's a couple of pictures here. That first little picture kind of tells you that this little sense organ is microscopic. If you kind of parse the muscle fibers, there's these little tiny spindles in there. Okay. If we go back to that bigger picture, they kind of exaggerate the size of the muscle spindle. And they have all these different colorful neurons that innervate the muscle spindle. I haven't talked about this. We talked about skeletal muscle. We did not talk about the muscle spindles. We talked about tendons, the connective tissue that attach muscle to bone. But we did not talk about the sensory neurons um, within the tendon called the GTOs. So in the first part of this lecture, I spent a lot of time talking about muscle spindles and something called Golgi tendon organs. Okay, so muscle spindles first. <coughs> So what they, I, used, I have to use this picture. I don't like the one from Marion. This kind of clearly teaches students the different parts to understand. These spindles are embedded within the muscle. The basic idea is you want to prevent muscle damage. You want to prevent your muscles from tearing. So these spindles are sensitive to stretch. stretch out muscle tissue, or not muscle, but connective tissues. Usually for muscles, if you stretch it out too much, they say the strain, they use the word strain, not sprain. So what yeah. would be considered an example of a, a stretch of the spindle? Well, when you, yeah, when you damage, when, when it doesn't work, or when it works? Oh, um, oh, um, I'm not sure what your question is. Okay, never mind. An example of what? Um, you said it's, it's susceptible to stretch. It's easily able to stretch. The muscle spindle. It's sensitive to stretch. Right. So what would make it stretch? Okay. Um, I'll get into that. Okay. Yeah. I think it's first um, best to understand all the circuitry here before we talk about how they stretch and how they can prevent stretch in muscle. But by being stretch sensitive, they'll prevent muscle injury. All right, so the sense organ um, is kind of, here's the spindle. I'll just draw it like that. And I'll draw it as a circle like that. Let's call that the muscle spindle with a circle in the middle. That's the sense organ. On the picture there, it's, it's the white spot. It's my spot there. Now, it's surrounded by skeletal muscle. skeletal muscle as striated. Now in this lecture, regular skeletal muscle fibers are called extrafusal fibers. The sense organ actually has on it a sensory neuron. 
they use the color black here to show a nerve that's a sensory neuron. So I'll just kind of here's here's a blue cell. It's a sensory neuron. So in terms of the spindle, the spindle has a sensory uh, neuron associated with it. So consider this, this circle, the, the sensory part of the muscle spindle. Now on either side of the spindle, there's muscle fibers. Okay, I'll use a different color. I use purple. And these muscle fibers are called intrafusal fibers, and they're on either side of the sense organ. Intrafusal fibers. So we have two kinds of muscle fibers. Extrafusal fibers are regular muscle uh, fibers that we've been talking about all semester. But associated with the muscle spindle are intrafusal fibers that um, are on either side of the sense organ. Okay, so we only have one type of neuron so far. We need two types of motor neurons to innervate the <coughs> intra and extrafusal fibers. Okay, so for the regular extrafusal fibers, um, the name of the The name of the uh, neurons are just regular motor neurons. Let's use the term alpha, alpha motor neuron. Now for the motor neurons that innervate the intrafusal fibers, let's call those gamma. So this is the structure. Three types of neurons. One is sensory. Two are motor. Okay. One for each type of muscle fiber. Um, and we have two types of muscle fibers, intra and extrafusal fibers. So the purpose of um, <coughs> muscle spindles, besides being stretch sensitive to prevent muscle injury, think more generally. If you're a good sensory neuron, that means you're always sending information to the central nervous system. Okay? And that's what's shown on this slide here. It says extrafusal fibers are at some resting length. Like you sitting in your chair, your quads. You're not using them because you're sitting. They're sending information to your central nervous system, these action potentials. Okay? The sensory neuron is tonically active. That means it's always on, sending some rate of action potentials to your central nervous system, the spinal cord. So these things are always on. I'll just say that they're tonically active. The spinal cord integrates the function. Alpha motor neurons to extrafusal fibers receive the tonic input from muscle spindles. Extrafusal fibers maintain a certain level of tension even at rest. So even when you're not actively using your muscles, you're just sitting there, your quads are at rest, there's still tone. There's always tone in your muscles unless you rip the nerves out. Okay, then there isn't.
muscle is always have tone oh, as the key word. But the spindle really isn't, it's just sending the information when the muscle's at rest. Um, the question becomes, for my first comment, how are they stretch sensitive? Well, for example, if you're to stretch a muscle, like for example, in a tendon tap, when you tap a tendon, tapping the tendon stretches the quad muscle out. Hopefully you can picture that in your mind here. When you stretch the muscle, you stretch the whole muscle with the spindle in it. That stretches the sense organ. So all of those little fibers that are wrapped around the sensory organ get squeezed, and that mechanical stimulation increases their firing rate. So kind of follow the train of thought here through this reflex. You tap the tendon, and doing that stretches the muscle. Therefore, stretch the spindle. So say stretches muscle and spindle. Spindle is inside of it, and well, basically, when you stretch that sensory organ, you increase the firing rate of this cell, the sensory neuron. I'll say increase AP firing of sensory neuron. So this cell, when it becomes stretched, imagine you stretch the muscle out, you pull it, and that muscle stretches and this is the thing is like, okay, I'm, I'm firing more. Those are my action potentials. Maybe before I was like firing at this rate. Maybe that is a, a rate when the muscles relax. <laughs> muscle stretches because of the tap, you fire, you fire more. If I just show you data on the test like this or this, and I ask you, hmm, when was the tendon stretched? You should be able to tell by the rate of firing right here. This is where the muscle was stretched. Yeah, I have all these cells on the board. I, I, I could like show you this data right here, muscle stretch. And I said, well, well, which cell is firing more? This one, the sensory neuron. Imagine multiple choice, sensory neuron, alpha, you know, gamma, motor neurons. And so I want to make sure you kind of know what's happening here. Your, this is the signal to your body, to your uh, central nervous system that you have to respond to this tendon tap. So the information goes to the spinal cord. The um, sensory <coughs> neuron will then, um, through the alpha motor neuron, make the muscle contract. Because that's what muscles do. They can contract. So the sensory neuron goes to the spinal cord. And then in there, it will send out onto an alpha motor neuron. That, that neuron is stimulated, so then the muscle contracts. So you have to look at the top graph. Um, when the muscle contracts, the muscle contracts and then it returns to its original length. So the top graph is muscle length. The bottom graph is the action potential firing from the spindle. Okay, so I hope that kind of makes sense to you. When the muscle returns to its initial length after it's stretched, the action potential rate falls off. Okay, so any questions on that?
Let me give you an example of how this works in real life besides a tendon tap. Because you, you don't ever do that in your natural course of the day. Maybe you do this. Um, you're carrying books. Maybe these are your A&P your books or something. You're carrying a book and you add to the load. When you add the load and you can kind of see you're about to get more books in your, um, in your hand and you want to maintain this joint angle, as soon as the books are added, there's a bit of a, an adjustment. Okay? You feel it's heavier. So there's a change in the joint angle ever so slightly. What you're doing is you're stretching the muscle, okay, and you adjust the tone for the increased load. So you kind of go back up a little bit, that kind of split second reaction. So all of this is happening, um, this whole sequence of things right here, in, in a split blink of an eye, okay? It's not a slow process. So that helps just kind of be your normal course of the day. Uh, the question becomes, what happens when you actually forcefully contract your muscles, like that guy flexing his muscles, okay? Um, because these things are stress <coughs> sensitive, when you really shorten the muscle, the spindles are gonna shorten with it. The thing about it is, when they shorten, hmm, well, let, me, let me read you a question here. Should muscle spindles be firing during active contraction? So I ask a question and then I answer it. Okay, because I want to make sure you're with me here. What do muscle spindles do during active contraction? Should muscle spindles be firing? No. Now, why is that the correct answer? What, is, what, are, what are these things sensitive to? Stretch. Stretch. When you contract your muscles, is the muscle lengthening or shortening? The muscle's shortening. So the spindle's shortening with it. Okay, so the reason why the answer is no, if you're stretch sensitive, when you shorten, you're not going to fire. Okay, that's why that's the correct correct answer. When the spindle is slack, it shouldn't fire. Okay, if stretching makes you fire more, being slack should make you fire less. Let me write that on the board. makes spindles fire more. If um, the spindle is slack, which is the opposite of stretch, it should fire less. These sensory neurons, these are ones that are sensitive to tension. If you squeeze it, it makes it fire more. If you squeeze it less, it'll fire less. These are mechanosensitive neurons. And hopefully that makes intuitive sense. Stretch it, fire more. Slack, fires less. That, that should happen. However, to answer follow-up <coughs> question, do we, do we want this to happen? We don't, this sentence right here, we don't want this. You're like, why? Well, if the cell is firing less, are you sending more or less information to your central nervous system? Less. We, we never like that, right? I guess a good example could be, you ever have like a patch of your skin just go numb? Just completely numb, and you're like, is that normal? Well, what's happening? The, the sensory neurons for that region aren't working, and you like you go to the doctor. You say, "What's what the heck's wrong? I have this numbness." So you know this is like kind of the same thing, except for the muscle spindles. If you're sending less information to the central nervous system, your senses are off. Okay, so we want to prevent this. 
Um, the thing is, muscles are designed to contract, so this should, should be happening all the time. So there's something called alpha-gamma coactivation that prevents uh, the spindle from going slack during active contraction. Alpha, gamma, coactivation. <clears throat> Prevents spindle slackening. during active muscle contraction. That, that's the key point right there. This is the mechanism I'll teach next. And uh, you want to keep the spindle stretched out while your whole muscle is shortening during active contraction. Okay. So that's what I have here. How do spindles fire when muscles contract? Um, alpha gamma coactivation. Here's a picture of it. So let's identify our parts. Is this a motor thing or a sense thing? This white part in the middle. Motor thing or sense thing? Motor or sensory thing? You got a 50-50 shot, just making sure you're with me this morning. It's sense. This is it the sensory organ? What is this whole thing? Identify structure. Muscle spindle. The muscle spindle is this whole thing. What is this white thing in the middle again? Sensory. The sense organ. Now what kinds of special muscle fibers are on this end and on this end? Intra or extrafusal fibers? Intra. The intra fib intra uh, fusal fibers is correct. What do we call this muscle fiber today? The extra. Okay. So this is showing you alpha gamma coactivation. So it maintains muscle spindle when the muscle contracts. I remember when I was a student, I was sitting out there like you guys are now. My professor was like, okay, this is one of the hardest things to teach. Students always get confused. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, okay. And I caught, that caught my attention, right? So now, now you're me, like, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> so it's my turn to try to make it clear. All right, so let's see if I can do it. Do you see these two arrows, how they're pointing in? What is the illustrator trying to show you in this graphic? Is the muscle contracting or being stretched when the arrows are pointing in? Contraction. Contraction. Just like you would want it to. Okay. These nerves are stimulating this muscle to contract. So here's a, here's a neuron. Here's a neuron. And here's a neuron. That's three neurons. Now what do we call this neuron? That's the sensory one. Right? Now we had two kinds of motor neurons. The alpha, what was the other one? Gamma, very good, do with me. Which one was this, alpha or gamma? That's the alpha, the gamma was for intrafusal. Okay, so. Follow, follow the things here, let's kind of write it out so you can think about it step by step. So this is a different situation. You're not tapping a tendon and stretching a muscle reflexively. You're, you're actually just doing a voluntary conscious movement. This is alpha gamma coactivation. So the first step they say, alpha motor neuron fires and gamma motor neuron fires. <coughs> okay, let me write that on the board. <coughs> You have two motor neurons that are firing at the same time. 
Yeah. I yeah. guess I'm just noticing that there's two gamma. That's right, because you have intrafusal fibers on the top and bottom. Okay. Just call them both gamma. So they're kind of gamma. as a pair. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, three types, but technically I guess that would be four. Yeah. All right, so um, look at the firing rate. If I were to improve this figure, I would make students look at the firing rate of this cell here. Which cell are they monitoring here, a motor or a sensory cell? Sensory. So do you see this triangle? Why did they put that there? That's where the muscle shortens. But look before the shorten, shortening, look at the firing rate. I would pay attention to that. Okay, so get back to this figure. I'm gonna um, read this again. Alpha motor neuron fires, gamma motor neuron fires. Do you see why they call this process alpha gamma coactivation? There's the alpha, there's the gamma. Simply because they're firing kind of simultaneously. All right, so number two, muscle contracts. Now here's the thing, the spindle's contracting with it. it it's shortening. Here's the thing, we want to prevent the sense organ from getting shorter with the whole muscle, okay? Let me write that for this step. That's what you should be thinking about. We want to prevent spindle, sa uh, spindle slackening. while the whole muscle shortens. Now the whole muscle is contracting. That's the effectiveness of the alpha motor neurons. To accomplish what I just wrote, we want the spindle to keep from slackening. That's gamma. So let me read step three. Stretch on the centers of intrafusal fibers are unchanged, okay? Firing rate of afferent neuron remains constant. Stretch on centers of intrafusal fibers unchanged. Okay, if I were to kind of like paraphrase this, I mean, look what they draw. They, they, here's the intrafusal fibers, and they're stretching on one side, and they're stretching on the other side. That keeps the middle from shortening. Can you picture that in your mind? You're contracting here, and you're contracting here. The whole muscle shortening, but like you're arranged differently. You don't contract in the middle. You contract on both sides and keep the center stretched out. Can you visualize that in your mind? Think about that. And you got to understand that to get this. And it's really not written well on the figures. Let me see if I can write that out. So that contracts. All right. So also what's happening in number two, I'll use a different color. No, I'll use this. Intrafusal fibers. Contract on on both sides of the sense structure. I'll say both sides of the sensory part of the spindle. Oh, that's probably a better way to put it. Sensory part of the spindle. So since um, you have fibers contracting on either side, this keeps the, the spindle from slackening okay, during muscle contraction. This prevents spindle slackening.
I would say this paragraph that I wrote, the second one, that's the key to understand the alpha gamma coactivation. Okay, you coactivate them together so that every time you move a joint, you contract a muscle. The spindle doesn't slacken. <laughs> that's the key. If the spindle doesn't slacken, the sensory neuron, which is stretch sensitive, it'll just keep firing at the same rate. That that's kind of the the result there. Oh, that, that's the third point that they make. Firing rate of afferent neuron remains constant. I'll paraphrase it. Sensory neuron maintains constant firing rate. Now, you should be able to see that in the figure. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm you, I'm, I'm studying this, okay. So, uh, fire rem remains constant, hmm, how do I see that? Oh, okay, what do I see? Oh, it looks like at this point, the muscle got shorter, but the firing rate didn't change, okay. Uh, I teach at the Science Skills Center, or Science Success Center, and one of the things we teach is um, this, we teach a lot of different things. We teach this thing called talk to the text where it's like you have to talk yourself through the figure. Figures like this are a good one for you to do it for. Okay, you do, or you do a figure analysis or something, like, or you paraphrase the figure. I mean, figures like this will be on lecture exam seven. I can promise you that. So let's look at more figures like this that are on the test. The top one is what we just looked at. That, that is when, hey, everything's working normal for the spindle. The second one kind of shows you what could go wrong if the spindles don't work properly. This says, let me read from the top, I know it's small. Uh, without gamma motor neurons, muscle contraction causes spindle firing rate to decrease. Okay. Write that on the board. <clears throat> Gamma motor neurons muscle contraction causes spindle firing rate to decrease. So they show you like that top graph there. Um, muscle length. And they kind of show you the exact <coughs> point when the muscle shortens. Right? And then they show you Normally, what should happen? What should happen if you have gamma working okay, the firing rate shouldn't change. You're sending the right information to your central nervous system. I'll just say gamma working. Firing rate remains unchanged. Okay, but if it doesn't work, At the moment it shortens, it like 
you start losing your senses. Okay. Camera not working. For whatever reason, gamma is not working. The spindle is slackening, so the sensory neuron just responds to that and um, fires less. And we don't want that. We want to maintain our tone. Okay. Is there any questions on those two <coughs> figures? It works, it doesn't work, basically. Now, you have figures in your other. This is like the. I don't like this figure, I'm just going to skip right over it. I, I taught you everything I need to know from the previous one. I just wanted to show you what that figure looked like in the Marriott textbook for those of you who use it. Uh, this um, next ten, um, organ is not within the belly of the muscle. It's in the tendon of the muscle. They're called GTOs or Golgi tendon organs for short. <coughs> So this is a reflex response to excessive force. I'm changing gears now. I'm done with the spindle, moving on to GTOs. So this one shows the muscle spindle. I showed you that before. It's like, okay, let's prevent um, stretching. And when you increase the load, you kind of make quick adjustments. The Golgi tendon organs, um, if the force is too excessive, you can see how the sensory neuron is kind of intertwined within the collagen fibers of the tendon. they kind of prevented muscles from stretching too much. These do the same thing for the tendon of the muscle. If you squeeze those collagen fibers too much, um, basically a force that's too great will squeeze the sensory neuron, making it fire. And this will actually ultimately prevent the tendon from tearing, prevents tendon injury. That's the goal. prevents tendon injury from excessive weight or excessive force. All right, so this um, is shown, that reflex. There's some terms here I didn't use before. Golgi tendon organs inhibit the agonist muscle. Let me define those terms muscle that is an agonist muscle. The agonist muscle, if I can spell it right, yeah, ag that's right, agonist, that's the muscle that you're using for the movement you want to do. Okay. Muscle used for desired movement. antagonist that's the, the muscle that would oppose the movement you want to do basically the muscle that opposes the desired movement. Agonist, antagonist. Okay, basically it's 
the idea. I guess the be best way to look is to give you any examples here. Um, just think of the, uh, I don't know, elbow. That's the joint I want to move. Now I can move it a couple of ways. Let's think of biceps and triceps for the elbow. Bies and tries. Let's say I want to flex on elbow. I want to do that. <coughs> I have control of my body. I want to flex. Which muscles do I want to use to flex the elbow? You haven't forgotten that, have you? Biceps. That's an easy one. Biceps. So, therefore, based on our definition, biceps is what? Agonist, antagonist. The agonist, okay? And that, that's the, in this example, uh, if you want to flex, this becomes the Antagonist. So what's triceps? Antagonist. Antagonist. You, you use biceps to flex your elbow, not the triceps. So antagonist. So let me ask you another question. Um, which muscle do you want to stimulate? The agonist or the antagonist? The agonist, yeah, I wasn't trying to trick you there. At the same time, which muscle do you want to inhibit? Triceps. Yeah, antagonist. So basically, that's it. You know, stimulate the agonist. If you have to, inhibit the antagonist. Okay, now, is triceps always the antagonist? No. I mean, what if you want to extend the elbow? I want to extend instead of flex. Oh, I guess you just have to switch them then, right? The triceps becomes the agonist and the biceps, you know, I'm not going to write that, but you get the point. Okay. GTOs inhibit the um, agonist muscle. Oh, okay. You know, why would you want to do that? Uh, prevent injury. The force is too great. So, let's see an example of that here, I think. Here you go. So the top frame, oh, that's a load you can handle. Okay, top frame right here. You add load, maybe that's 30 pounds, maybe you can handle that, okay? You have a little spindle there, the GTOs and the tendon, I can handle that. I'm not gonna tear out of the, the radial tuberosity, my insertion point, okay? Now what if that's too heavy? I can't handle that, and I don't wanna, injure my tendon. What the GTO does, if you, I'm going to zoom in on this, you're going to inhibit the agonist. Load too heavy, muscle contracts, but it's too much. Things are starting to tear. What happens is the, um, there's an inhibit, inhibiting interneuron right there, and see how it came from the GTO, right there, uh, basically you'll inhibit the agonist, let me write that on the board first. Low too heavy? I'll call it GTO for short, cold Japan normal. The GTO, that sensory neuron from the GTO, or right there, GTO, sensory neuron, stimulates an inhibiting interneuron. to inhibit the agonist muscle, because the load is too heavy. That's shown in this frame there. To inhibit 
pivot agonist muscle. So practice your science success center study skills, especially those of you who took it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, look at your notes, huh? Dr. Ron wrote, low too heavy, detailed sensory organ. Reread your notes, and then go through this. Neuron from Golgi tendon organ fires. Motor neuron inhibited. Muscle relaxes. Lotus drop. Meaning, does it, does it the same thing to you? So, oh, I, I get that. If you don't get it, just keep rehearsing until you do. Do you have any questions on that right now? Do you see why you dropped it? What muscle did you inhibit? The, the agonist muscle. You inhibited the agonist muscle. Normally, you don't do that. Right? Normally, this is what you do. Why did we inhibit the agonist in this example? It's too heavy. Can't handle it. Okay. Did you ever pull a muscle? That, that didn't work for you. I mean, people injure, get injuries all the time. You can strain your muscle. You can tear your muscle. You can, you can tear your tendons. Okay, especially if you're a competitive athlete. So this is an example where we inhibit the agonist. Drop the load, hopefully not on your toes. Um, okay, more, more reflexes. This is a, a basic one, flexor reflex. Inhibit extensors. This is a reflex in response to a painful stimulus. Flexor reflex, and you say inhibit extensors. Uh, let me show you the picture. You want to um, stimulate the flexors, inhibit the extensors in response to a painful stimulus. I mean, naturally, uh, the reaction is to flex away from pa from pain. Flex away. In this example, the painful stimulus says grab a hot pan handle. I forgot to put the, uh, use a towel or something. So here's the sensory neuron. It's colored red. And it's doing a couple of things. It's stimulating the flexors, inhibiting um, extensors. Okay, so you can flex away. That's pretty straightforward. Stimulate, inhibit. In this example, what's the agonist muscles? The flexors or the extensors? The flexors are the agonists. That's what you want to do. Now, it's a little different if um, you have a crossed extensor reflex, okay? Because you have two limbs. You could be in a situation where you need to do the opposite thing with the other limb. It's called crossed extensor reflex. Let's look at a couple of examples here. So, um, we, we're talking about both extremities here. Uh, one extremity would be the site of painful stimulus. The 
the other side is basically the side opposite, whatever side it is. Well, on the painful stimulus side, he's grabbing your wrist. Ow, you're hurting me. You don't touch me. You flex away. On the other hand, you, you kind of extend and push him away, kind of like that. Get away from me. So punch him in the face. Him or her, whatever it is. So anyways, so flex away. So on this side, wait, what are you doing? You're stimulating the flexors, inhibiting um, extensors. Flexors, extensors. So on this side, stimulate them. The extensors inhibit. But on the other side, there's information that carries over through the spinal cord. I don't know if you remember studying the gray commissures. One side's connected to the other, so the information's crossing over to the other side. The anterior gray commissure in this example. Anterior gray commissure. Okay, so the information goes from this side and the side opposite to push away, you do the reverse, right? Inhibit, stimulate. So you can uh, push away from the painful stimulus. So that was an example of um, the upper limbs. Um, okay, let's do this one for lower limbs because arms and legs are a little different. And let me kind of not just say flexors, extensors. Let me say quads and hamstrings, see if you remember those muscle groups. Quads and hammies. Stepping on a nail. We've all done that, step on something sharp. So, painful stimulus. Um, looks like it's his right uh, leg, foot. Okay, what does he want to do on the painful stimulus? He wants to flex away. Which one? Which one's flex? Flex the knee? Are you kidding me? I have to know this? Now come on, what is it? Hi. Quads extend, hamstrings flex. Oh yeah. Okay, so flex away, great, but you don't want to fall down. So the other leg, you want to stand on. You want, you want to stand on the leg, flex away this leg. Okay. Hmm. I want to stand. Hmm. I want to extend the knee. Which one do I want to stimulate? Extend the knee. Quads. Inhibit the flexors, the hamstrings. Okay, that's basically it. You can kind of keep the information straight, that's cross extensor. Always flex away from the pain, but the other side may do the opposite. Crossed extensor, you see how it's called that? Cross extensor? Um, the other side is the extendor, okay? Because the gray commissure is making the other limb do the opposite, that's the reflex. Okay, the ear, let me start the ear. I'm just gonna start it, I'll give you a break. I'm kind of shifting gears here. We went from spindles and GTOs and different kinds of reflexes <coughs> to more sensations. This is the special sense of the ear.
I'm going to start by not showing you the ear, showing you a bone of the skull associated with the ear, the temporal bone. But if I don't know if you remember studying your ear hole, maybe you haven't studied it yet at all. Identify external acoustic meatus. That's your um, ear canal. And basically, that's showing you the inner ear structure. Okay. Um, the inner ear structure associated with the temporal bone is inside of there. The superior aspect, looking at the cranial base, you can see what I taught you yesterday, cranial nerve 8, vestibular cochlear, exits internal acoustic meatus to um, serve the inner ear organ. So that, that's the key, the inner ear. It's got the hair cells that communicate with cranial nerve 8. So we'll get to that. Take, take a step back and look at the whole ear. We have like models of this in the room. Um, what we see is that the ear is divided into different regions here. The external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Now, for the most part, the external ear and the middle ear are for um, trans the transference of sound waves to the inner ear structure, where the hair cells are. The external ear and middle ear are mainly to um, transfer sound wave energy to the inner ear organ. It's got the hair cells so what we see is that the external ear is basically the oracle and the external acoustic meatus commonly know as our ears, okay, um, called the oracle, which means ear in anatomy. Oracle is basically, it's elastic cartilage covered with thin skin. That's basically what your ears are. There's a lot of anatomy to our ears. There's a lot of raised regions and grooves and depressions that all have names, and you're not responsible for them. If you're interested in what those are, um, you can look them up yourself. You know, the deepest <coughs> one here, called the concha, is where you put your, you know, your earbuds for your Bluetooth or whatever. Uh, but it's basically funneling the sound to the external acoustic meatus. Okay also part of the external ear. External acoustic meatus, also called external auditory meatus, same thing. You may see it on a test or something. Both terms are used commonly, external acoustic or auditory meatus. Um, I taught that as part of the temporal bone. It, it's, it's part of the inner ear. It's basically an ear canal that's about two to three centimeters long. It, it leads up to the tympanic membrane, your eardrum. Literally a membrane right there. But the tympanic membrane is not part of the external ear, but it just leads up to it. External acoustic It's a two to three centimeter um, canal. leading up to the tympanic membrane. You know, there is skin and cartilage in the outer third. Uh, you have glands in there, um, ruminous glands.
that secretion is, you know, the earwax in our ears. Earwax. The earwax, uh, basically, it can help keep um, the tympanic membrane kind of pliable, keeps it from drying out. <coughs> Keeps membrane pliable. Um, it has it's antimicrobial. It's antibacterial. Okay. Antibacterial. You know you know what your earwax is. It, it, it helps trap debris too. Okay. Keep stuff out of your ear canal. Maybe bugs crawling in there. My roommate in college, they fell asleep on the carpet and it was, you know those earwigs crawl right in his ear. Had to go in there with tweezers to get it out. You know those little earwigs with the pincher? Pincher bug called in his ear canal. So don't fall asleep on the carpet. Keep things out of your ear canal. Or just vacuum. <laughs> and I don't think we vacuum much. In our bachelor pad. All right, so tympanic cavity. Let's talk about the middle ear. This is the external ear. Here's a picture of the middle ear. And on the picture we were just at, we're going to look at that little, it's like a little apartment inside your head there. Okay, It's air filled. Okay? A lot of things in your body are fluid filled. The middle ear is air filled, called the tympanic cavity right there. Let me, let me teach from this first. This is considered the middle ear. Are just funneling sound waves up to the tympanic membrane. You got the middle ear here. Middle ear. So the structures include, uh, well, the, the space is called tympanic cavity. You should write that down. Inside that little space inside your ear is um, the tympanic membrane. So the whole point of that membrane is the external ear is funneling the sound waves um, and it's going to basically vibrate that membrane at the same frequency or hertz. Here funnels sound wave um, sound waves and vibrates this membrane at the same frequency. Uh, maybe I haven't taken physics yet, but sound is waves, and waves have kind of like this an amplitude and frequency, which is which uh, talks about if the sound waves are short versus long. Shorter sound waves have more energy, okay? The hertz is higher. Hertz is a term you should become familiar with. Hertz is like um, how many waves are passing a fixed point per second. Sound waves are traveling. The sound is traveling, my voice traveling to your ear in the back of the room. It takes a certain amount of time to get there. Okay, that's Hertz. Um, in terms of what does that sound like, that shorter sound waves um, the pitch is like higher, treble. So if that's treble, what's that? 
base or mid range something, you know, get the idea. So it's a lower energy. There's there's less energy in this as opposed to higher frequencies. So basically, um, you know, there's there's um, there's the hertz, right? But there's also the amplitude. Give you an example. Now I drew the red and the black for my base example, the same hertz, but I drew the amplitude different. Which has more energy, the red or the black? The red does. Amplitude, bigger sound waves. Amplitude, more, more louder. Turn up the bass. It sounds good on your stereo. So amplitude, whether it be big or small, is perceived as loudness, right? So again, frequency is pitch discrimination, but amplitude is volume. Okay, now whatever that is, I, I speak loud, I speak soft, you know, at a certain frequency. You're vibrating the membrane at that frequency and amplitude, okay? Well, anyways, that tympanic membrane is connected to your auditory ossicles. So that turn, there's three of them. Three auditory ossicles. Maliacinca stapes. The hammer. The anvil. And the stirrup. That's what they're named. They're called auditory ossicles. Os, O-S-S. -S. What tissue should that remind you of? Bone. bone. Things that are ossified are bone. These are the first things that ossify. They're very small bones. Uh, they're encased in leucite right here. Can you see them? They're really small. Okay, the smallest bones in your body. Uh, they're inside your tympanic cavity. Auditory, that refers to hearing. Okay. Um, these will kind of vibrate and they'll, they'll amplify the sound. Um, one thing I want to show you is, do you see how the tympanic cavity is um, continuous with this pharyngotympanic auditory tube? Let's write that down. Get that in here. Connecting tympanic cavity to your pharynx. Your pharynx is your throat. You know where your throat is, it's in the back of your mouth, or where you swallow. So basically, the ear is connected to the throat. Okay? And there's ear, nose, throat specialists, because all these things are connected. In fact, well, you're concerned with that if you have an infection, an infection can spread in different parts of the body. And well, anyways, that tube is continuous with your pharynx. Pharyngo, pharynx. So you, you should know that. So that's this tube here. So which part is affected when someone has vertigo? Oh, vertigo, that, that's this structure here, the inner ear. I haven't gotten to that yet. Vertigo is like the room is spinning because balance and equilibrium are some of the hair cells in there. Okay, so um, you got this tube, you got the auditory ossicles. Uh, let me show you a picture of the auditory ossicles. It's a little better. There are the auditory ossicles. Um, there's more anatomy here. You can see facial nerve going through there. There's a nerve called chorda tympani. I'm not sure what it does, don't worry about it. But you gotta know this, 
the membrane, the hepatic mem hepatic membrane, malleus incus stapes, looks just like a little horseshoe there, stir it, okay? And what, what these will do is these will, um, well, do you see how um, this part of the, the malleus is attached to the hepatic membrane? So if the membrane is vibrating at a certain sound wave frequency, this ossicular chain will vibrate, okay? So they're, they're transferring the sound wave energy from the tympanic membrane to this structure here called the oval window, which is connected to the inner ear. I'll write that down. So the auditory ossicles form this um, ossicular chain. <coughs> that transfers sound wave energy. membrane to the oval window. <coughs> now the oval window is not part of the middle ear. It's a window to the inner ear organ. So you should note that. But basically, the oval window is underneath the foot plate of stapes. Stapes is another one of those fun anatomy words. Spelled stapes, pronounced stapes. Sometimes it's called the foot, foot plate of stapes. So basically, stapes, obviously, in the picture is kind of like, kind of like that. That's the foot plate. Oval window is under there. Now, if you kind of look at the proportions here, what's bigger? The foot plate, which fits under the oval window, what's bigger, foot plate or tympanic membrane? The tympanic membrane is much bigger. Now, here's the thing. You're transferring all of this energy from this larger structure to this smaller structure, okay, without losing anything. You don't lose any, any energy. So what you're doing is you're going to amplify that energy from here when you concentrate it to a smaller space, okay? Uh, because the oval window is smaller. than the tympanic membrane. When the ossicular chain transfers the sound wave energy, it's amplified by a factor of 22. When the ossicular chain
transfers the sound wave energy uh, it is amplified by a factor of 22. I underlined it in red. I want you to re remember that number. That's code for it's going to be on the test. Uh. <coughs> so here's a picture of the ossicular chain. You vibrate that at a certain frequency. What's the frequency range for humans? Some like 200 hertz to 20,000. So the 20,000, is that treble or bass? The 20,000, the higher numbers, higher energy, high pitch, treble, lower numbers, bass. When you shop for headphones and you get the specs on the back, be sure it has this range. If that lower number is higher, the music you're listening to, if it's less than that, it'll sound distorted. So the best headphones have the range that we can hear. Uh, but anyways, whatever that is, and you're vibrating that at the same frequency, you're transferring it. What happens is that oval window it tilts a little bit. Um, the acicular chain transmits vibrations to the oval window, total amp amplification factor 22. If the, if the ossicular chain fails, uh, the patient will experience what's called conductive hearing loss. You're not conducting the sound waves as good as a normal person. Maybe it can result in loss of, you know, a magnitude of 20 decibels. So to give you an idea of the whole decibel thing, 30 decibels is, for example, the background noise of a quiet library. So you, know, you, can, you can kind of relate to that, I think, your college students. You study in the library. Uh, okay, so 70 is like busy street, you know, noise, noisy restaurant. If you try to talk to someone at Starbucks and it's really loud and busy, that, that's, you know, if you can hear that, that, that's good, but that's getting louder. You know, these are like, if you're not wearing protective hearing, you could damage your hearing. Okay, certainly this, certainly that. Here's a picture of um, the rocking action of the stapes tilting the oval window. Stapes is in its normal position in this picture on the left, right there. Okay, see how it tilts right there? And when it does so, um, this is basically inside the inner ear. You know, the inner ear is not air-filled, it's fluid-filled. So when you kind of like are like pushing in on a s structure that's filled with fluid, all of that energy is going to be transferred quite easily to something that's fluid-filled. So that's why that tilting is, you're like distorting it, and then the inner ear is going to pick up all that energy because of all the fluid that's in your inner ear. You shouldn't have fluid in your middle ear, but in your inner ear, yes. Here's a picture, close-up picture of it. So you, you kind of rock that oval window, and the fluid vibrates, okay? And you have membranes here, we'll get more into it later. These membranes have the hair cells on it. Um, and if the sound wave energy is, what it will do is it will kind of make these things vibrate. The vibrations will kind of deflect the hair cells, and so you can hear, uh, basically. Uh, the other thing I should mention, it's not in your study guide, but there are a couple of muscles that attach to this ossicular chain. One's been cut here. Um, there's the pedius and corda tympani, and um, I'm forgetting, my, my mind's blanking, but you don't have to know them. But, like the muscles that attach um, to the ossicular chain um, help minimize the movement so you don't perforate your eardrum. Okay, so they kind of stabilize the ossicular chain. Um, newer cars have a feature where um, right before a serious accident of the impact, 
the, the car will emit a pulse. The pulse will stimulate these muscles to stabilize the ossicles so that the sound of the impact won't rupture your eardrums. Okay? Hopefully that's a feature you never have to use in your car if you have a new car. Uh, my car has, I have a 2018 Honda Odyssey, it has it. My wife's car, she has 2017, her car has it. So I think the newer cars have that feature. I'll protect your eardrums. Okay. All right, we'll come back from break. We'll talk about the inner ear.